reason for holding inventories. Why do you think we hold inventories? The, the following are the reasons. You could ask yourself, why should the company hold inventories? Why? First of all, it could be to ensure sufficient goods are available to meet expected demand. You say maybe you, expect, you anticipate that the, the demand will be high. So the demand will be high, I'll hold invent, sufficient inventories so as to satisfy that demand. But also, it could be merely to produce a buffer between processes. I just need that when process, process B, process, if one process completes, it's completed, uh, and maybe it needs input from the other process, the materials will be already available. So that's why it could provide a buffer between processes. But also, it could be to meet any future shortage. In the case in the future, we expect you have some shortage, you can have inventories in place so that uh, when the shortage arises, uh, you can just compensate for it directly and instantly. But also, it could be to take advantage of bulk purchasing discounts. I think this is very, very obvious. Why do you hold inventory? You say that uh, the, the normal price per unit is two dollars, but if you buy in in bulk discount in bulk purchasing, mm -hmm. let's say you just pay one point five dollars per unit, and so you can just stock up the goods because the price is low. So that's the very very important reason. Bulk purchasing discount means trade discount, not cash discount. It's a trade discount. But also, uh, I could say that to absorb to absorb seasonal fluctuations and any variations in the usage and demand. And lastly, it would be to counteract the effect of future inflation. You expect that there will be a lot of inflation in the future. So you decide to buy a lot of goods now because in the future, you will have to consume a much, much higher amount. So that can the problem too. All right, and now here we are. We are on the inventory management cost section, which is very, very essential. Inventory management costs. What are the inventory management costs? Actually, inventory management costs are the costs that the company or the entity can incur when managing inventories. So first of all, we have ordering costs. Ordering costs are just the costs that, that are involved actually in making sure that you have inventory in your store. And then the holding costs, you already have inventory in your store, then those costs that we incur. And we have stock out costs, stock out costs. When speaking of stock out costs are the costs that are incurred due to running out of stock. You have run out of stock. Maybe uh, customers will see you as a bad supplier or something like that. You lose goodwill, something like that. You will fail to sell goods, so you lose contribution. So there are matters like that, all right? All right, so let's start up with ordering costs. And for now, we just take a look at this ordering cost and holding costs. So what are ordering costs, as I said? Ordering costs are also, ordering costs are also known as setup costs. These are ordering costs, they're also known as setup costs. And what are setup costs now, or, or ordering costs? As I told you that if inventories are kept low, for example, I just spoke of ordering costs above, right? These are the costs that you incur to make sure that inventory is in store. So if inventories are kept low, let's say you need a thousand units in a year, but uh, you just have small inventories. So let's say maybe you order 10 units. Whenever I make an order, you order 10 units. That means you have to order a hundred times, a thousand over 10. But if you need a thousand units in a year and you order hundred units, you only have to order 10 times. So if inventories are kept low, that means that small quantities of inventory will have to be ordered more frequently. It will be the small quantity, but you have to order it more frequently. That means there'll be a lot lot number of orders. Then if number of orders increase, then the ordering cost will also increase. So that's why we say thereby increasing the total ordering cost, things like this. And now let's go here. We have some examples of ordering costs. The following are examples of ordering costs. In ordering, you usually know that uh, you can have, after receiving your inventory, you will have to transport them. So you can have transport costs, but just before transporting them, you need to load them to the truck. And after transporting them, you need to unload them. So you can have loading and unloading of inventory, loading and unloading costs. After unloading them, you, have, you can have to inspect them just before receiving, yes? So inspection costs, testing costs, and receiving, these are the other costs. 
but also it would have production run cost for internal manufacturing. Now, by saying setup cost, you know, sometimes we manufacture internally, so you could have production run cost, which we usually call them setup cost or ordering cost. So for the company that is producing internally, we usually call them setup costs or production run costs. So it's something like that. All right, let's now go to the formula. How do you obtain the total cost of ordering? Simply speaking, total cost of ordering, you would have the ordering cost per order. So just take a look at how much does a single order cost? And then how many orders do I need in a period, let's say in a year? So I'll take ordering cost per order and the number of orders. Then after that, I'll just try to take a look uh, on how I determine the number of orders. What is the number of orders? As I told you, suppose in a year you need a total of 1,000 units, but you order 100 units. If you divide them, you just get 10 orders. So simply speaking, the number of orders equals to the demand per period over the order quantity. The order quantity is that uh, quantity of inventory that you usually order when you need them. That's why you say reorder. You order each time you need inventory, you order that one. So demand is shortening the D and the reorder quantity shortening as Q. So simply speaking, total cost of ordering, TCO, total cost of ordering equals to demand times ordering cost per order over quantity. This is a very, very essential formula. You should keep it in your head and tight, right? Now, I've spoken of reorder quantity. What is the reorder quantity? I just spoke of it above here. But what is the reorder quantity? Reorder quantity is just the quantity that you always order. It is the quantity of inventory for which an order is placed for replenishment when inventory reaches the reorder level. So it's something like that. You know, uh, let me show you a nice example here. I could just do this. Let's say in a year you need, a, you have a demand for 10,000, let's say 10,000 units. But uh, Let's say that you always you always order, or let's say that I need the number of orders, number of orders. In the entire year, I need to order, I need to make 20 orders. So if you need to make 20 orders, you could ask yourself how you are going to obtain this reorder quantity. I'll say that, oh, so the order quantity, I'll just take 10,000 over 20, right? And how much would this be? 1,000 over two, that is 500. So this will be uh, the reorder quantity, right? So that will be the situation here. And now I can proceed to holding cost. What are the holding costs now? Holding costs also, also known as carrying costs. These are the costs that are the company involves itself in maintaining inventory in store in the extended area. So, if inventories are too high, if you have too high inventories, that means that you need, it will be much, much more difficult to hold them. So holding costs will be incurred unnecessarily. And examples of holding costs are as follows. First of all, uh, as I told you above, that if you order small quantities, then ordering costs will be high. And even if you check here, you will find this. Look. Total cost of ordering is inversely proportional to the order quantity. So the lower the order quantity, the higher the total cost of ordering. But for holding costs, it becomes different, as we'll see in the formula. So the following are the examples of holding costs. So just beware. Holding costs could include the following. It could include cost of storage and stores operation. You know, you are holding inventory to hold them, you need maybe space, and that space is costly. So the more the inventory, the more the space needed. And then we have to this thing called cost of capital or lost investment opportunity. You know, we say that you hold inventory which you paid for, or maybe you borrowed somewhere to buy such inventory so you can have cost of capital or lost investment opportunity. You could have used that money elsewhere uh, to make an investment, but you didn't do that. So this is among the cost of holding inventory. That's why we say holding inventories involve the locking up of funds, which would have had a better alternative use. Again, you could have insurance costs. You know, uh, if you have a lot of inventory in store and when uh, you insure them, uh, also the holding costs will be high. So the larger the value of inventory held, the greater the insurance premiums are likely to be. But also we have risk of obsolescence. You know, by having a lot of inventory in store, what if they become obsolete? 
if they become upright, they will fall in value and I would have suffered a lot. So the longer an inventor item fails, the greater is the risk of obsolescence. And also we have deterioration. If you invent a deteriorate, you will have to dispose of them. Disposing of them will make you incur costs. And lastly, you have pilferage. Pilferage gives just a little effect. You have someone working in your store, and every day they take some little amount of inventory, which you do not directly recognize. You do not instantly recognize, but in time, you will just know that uh, things have stolen and you will have suffered. So that's what we call pilferage, right? All right, now let's go to the computation. Total cost of holding. How do you obtain the total cost of holding? To obtain the total cost of holding, you take the holding cost per unit, per period, not very careful. This is per unit, per period, time average inventory. So if your period is one year, you are being asked to compute total cost for one year, you have to make sure that this cost is per year. Even if it is given on a per month basis, you have to convert it. So you multiply by average inventory because inventory that you hold will be changing, will be changing the level. So you have to do that. All right, how do you obtain average inventory? This is the easy formula. You just take buffer inventory plus Q over two. Buffer inventory is usually the minimum level of inventory here. Buffer inventory, or we call it just the stock, is just the minimum amount of inventory required to be maintained in order to avoid uncertainty in supply and demand. So that's what we really have. So this is just the average. This will always be there, but this load of quantity will be changing. So just take this one, which will always be there, plus Q over two. But in most scenarios, this buffer is zero in most scenarios. So even in some books, you wouldn't find this buffer here. It will just be Q over two. So to obtain total cost of holding, you take the average event, which is B plus Q over two, then you multiply by CH. All right, something like this. So this is the formula for Holding costs, and lastly, we have stock out costs, or we call them shortage costs. These arise if the entity runs out of inventory. You run out of inventory and you fail to deliver orders to customers. Customers, you lose goodwill, things like that. So these are stock out costs. So what causes stock out costs? Oh, this is the, the stock out costs, I mean, the, Example of stock out costs. You could call this, listen, you could call this example as example of stock out costs, right? You could call this as example of stock out costs. You could have lost contribution from most sales because you know profit equals to sales minus variable cost minus fixed cost. So sales minus variable cost is known as contribution. So profit equals to contribution minus fixed cost. So you could lose contribution because fixed cost will always be there. So you cannot say loss of profit. Of course, profit will have been lost, but uh, to be more precise, let's speak of contribution here. But there is a loss of future sales due to disgruntled customers. You bore customers and the customers won't, need, won't, won't no longer need to be provided supplied the good by you. <laughs> and then you can have the loss of customer goodwill. Customer won't will, will lose, will lose their trust in you. You could have the cost of production stoppage, things like this, but also we can have labor frustration over stoppages. Labor could be frustrated due to uh, the season of production. But also we say extra cost of urgent purchases. You know, you needed inventory, you said that, oh, I need to secure this inventory no matter what, so as not to stop production. If you are buying a unit at two dollars, you could find that that same unit can be bought for three dollars. So this would imply an extra cost of one dollar per unit. So uh, at the beginning, I uh, will just ignore these stock out costs. You know they are not very common, and in some sections, they are usually not studied at all. But I'll just go for them all. All right. So by ignoring them. Total cost of inventory will be total cost of ordering, plus total cost of holding, plus inventory purchase cost. It would be just like this, all right? Yeah. And then you can proceed further. Now. So uh, I think you can just end up here. And if you haven't subscribed here, subscribe for regular updates. Thank you very much. And until next time.